ان الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور انفسنا ومن سيئات اعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له واشهد ان لا اله الا الله وحده لا شريك له واشهد ان سيدنا ونبينا محمدا عبده ورسوله اما بعد <coughs> so let me begin by thanking you all for attending to taking thanking you all for taking time out of your Tuesday evening to be with us here in the clubhouse be with here being hosted alhamdulillah by Muslimatic University and getting together for what we hope will be the first of many uh, group therapy sessions for people who have reverted to Islam and sometimes we as reverts um, we experience trauma and the trauma may differ from one revert to another revert but one of the things that we oftentimes have in common when we sit and talk and share our stories is some type of trauma related to our conversion to Islam and a lot of times that trauma goes untreated in immigrant Muslim communities and we want to try to get together virtually uh, at the outset and hopefully the day will come when we can get together in person to do some of that group therapy and to talk about issues which are pertinent to people like us and people who have our circumstance. Uh, this program, the Reverts Roundtable, will be a monthly program on Muslimatic, but it will eventually be delivered more frequently. Could be bi-monthly, could be weekly. It's gonna depend on the audience. It's gonna depend on what you want and how frequently you want to get together. The program will also eventually move to a Safi's clubhouse. So as you all know, I have my own platform, which is called an Islam as Safi, a Safi for short. And we do have our own uh, clubhouse. And we would like you uh, to sign up and join our clubhouse at a Safi. And you can look at it, look for it under my name, or you can look for it under the name of a Safi with a hyphen. A Safi with a hyphen and two A's. You should be able to find it and a Y at the end, I-Y at the end. You should be able to find the page. Please sign up for that because ultimately this programming will move to that clubhouse. Uh, as for topics, we are very interested in hearing from you, our audience, about the topics you would like discussed and addressed on the program. And so we want you to immediately begin sending us your suggestions and you can send those to the following email addresses. Uh, the first one is admin at asafi without a hyphen. And ad, I'm sorry, admin at asafi. That's A-S-S-A-A-F-I-Y dot org. The second one is abdullah dot alansari at asafi dot org. And the last one is muslimatic1 at gmail.com. So you can send your suggestions for topics to any one of those email addresses and please start doing that immediately. If there's something that you really want to have discussed, something that you feel um, is important to you in your life, or you just think it will benefit reverts generally, then please share that with us and we will definitely try to take up that topic and address it in coming uh, session. Uh, tonight, what I thought we would do for the inaugural uh, program is I wanted to share part of a story of the life of one of the Prophet's companions وسلم, and mention a few lessons we can derive from it. And the story is very pertinent to people like us, to people who have converted to Islam uh, and have experienced trauma or experienced some hardship as a consequence. And after we mention the story, inshallah ta'ala, we will open the floor for individual contributions from our audience. Now, before we do that, I want to mention some rules, some rules of engagement. 
So the first thing I want to ask or humbly request is that you limit your comments, your questions, etc., whatever uh, you want to contribute, whatever you want to say. We'd like you to uh, limit whatever you're going to contribute to two minutes or less, preferably less. And that's because we like to give as many people an opportunity to speak and to contribute as possible. Uh, the second uh, rule is that we expect everyone in the room to be polite and respectful. And to remember that the speaker and the audience are your brothers and sisters in faith. And we have to treat other believers with kid gloves. And we have to be careful how we speak to them and how we speak about them. And the Prophet, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Quran, the Prophet and the Sunnah, they both have been emphatic about the mercy and the compassion and the care and the concern that is supposed to be uh, observed amongst the Muslims. And somehow, some way, we've lost our way and forgotten that. And sometimes we are harsher with the Muslims than we are with non-Muslims. And so again, we want to remind that we need to be polite and respectful in what we say, especially if we're saying something which is directed at someone who is in the room, whether it be the speaker or someone in the audience, etc. Uh, the last thing I want to say as far as rules is that if you've come here to debate, to create controversy, or engage in a verbal altercation, you are in the wrong room and should kindly and peacefully exit this one. This is not what we're here to do. We're not here to fight with each other. We're not here to call each other names. And I want us to operate and to move forward this evening and beyond, bearing in mind the hadith in which the Prophet ﷺ, he said, Sibab al-Muslim fusuq. Kufr. He said, insulting, demeaning, saying something derogatory about or towards another Muslim is sin. It's sinful. It's sinful behavior. Kufr. And fighting with him or her, your Muslim brother or sister, is a type of disbelief, is a form of disbelief. And so bear that in mind, let's all bear that in mind as we move forward this evening and beyond in our interactions and in our interpersonal relations and interpersonal communications with each other. So tonight, inshallah ta'ala, we're going to reflect on the life story of one of the illustrious companions of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu And this companion is Mus'ab ibn Umair radiallahu anhu. Now Mus'ab ibn Umair uh, was born and he grew up in the lap of affluence and luxury. You could say he was born with a silver spoon in his mouth. His rich parents lavished a great deal of care and attention upon him. He wore the most expensive clothes and the most stylish shoes of his time. As a youth, he was admired by the Quraysh, not only for his good looks and style, but for his intelligence, his elegant bearing and keen mind endeared him to the Meccan nobility, among whom he moved with ease. Although still young, he had the privilege of attending Quraysh meetings and gatherings. He was thus in a position to know the issues which concerned the Meccans and what their attitudes and strategies were. At that time, the Meccans were dismayed and threatened by the emergence of Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam, who preached a new and peculiar religion, saying that there is no God but Allah. And most of us brothers and sisters in this room can empathize with something being new and peculiar. Something which, given the pervading tradition in our society and in our culture and in our families and in the circles in which we moved, Islam appeared to those people as something odd, something strange, something different, something weird. And we can empathize with that. We had that experience that when people that were in our circles at that time when we were curious about Islam, they considered Islam something Weird and weird in a bad way. We can empathize with that. The vulnerable Quraysh leaders thought of ways of silencing Muhammad وسلم, when ridicule and persuasion did not work. They embarked on a campaign of harassment and persecution. They started persecuting 
the Prophet's companions to deter other people from becoming Muslim. Mus'ab learned that Muhammad and those who believed in his message were gathering in a house near the hill of As-Safa to evade Quraysh harassment. This was the house of Al-Arqam. To satisfy his curiosity, Mus'ab proceeded to the house undeterred by the knowledge of Quraysh hostility. So he knew that they were hostile. He knew that they didn't like this new religion. They didn't like that people were accepting it and leaving the religion of their forefathers. But this didn't deter Mus'ab ibn Umar. And most of us can, be, can empathize with this too. We can empathize with being driven by curiosity to investigate Islam, to go to a mosque, to talk to Muslims. Even though there were people in our circle who were like, you're not going to do that, are you? You're not thinking about that, are you? They were hostile. But we were undeterred by that hostility. We can empathize with that. Mus'ab was totally overwhelmed by what he had seen and heard. The words of the Quran had made a deep and immediate impression on him. And we can empathize with that too. We can empathize with hearing the Quran for the first time. And at that moment, listening to it, and although we didn't understand the words, it was as if it was speaking to us. We had never heard anything like it. It's almost like a baby who doesn't understand whatever language they're born into. But they, when their mother speaks to them, they understand. There's a connection between their mother's voice in a language that they don't at that time, the time of their birth, they don't understand. But when they hear their mother's voice, they're soothed by it. They're calmed by it. And we experience that. We can empathize with what Mus'ab felt when he heard the Quran. Because most of us, many of us, we felt that. We experienced that. We know what that's like. So much so that in the first meeting with the Prophet, the young and decisive Mus'ab declared his acceptance of Islam. He declared the Shahada, heard the Quran, heard the Prophet preach, and khalas, I'm done, I'm ready to do this. I'm ready to make this move. Upon accepting Islam, Mus'ab had one major concern. His mother, Khunnas bint Malik. She was a woman of extraordinary power and influence. She had a dominant personality and could easily evoke fear and terror. When Mus'ab became a Muslim, the only power on earth he might have feared was his mother. And many of us can empathize with this too. Fearing, once you accept Islam, because you're just driven by conviction to accept it, after that excitement and enthusiasm kind of wanes a little bit and you think about, okay, what's going to be the repercussion? What's going to be the reaction? Fearing the reaction, fearing the rejection from family, from friends, from society, from co-workers and colleagues, fearing that we can empathize with that. We know what that feels like. All the powerful nobles of Mecca and their attachment to pagan customs and traditions were of little consequence to him. Musab didn't care about that. But having his mother as an opponent, however, could not be taken lightly. This was difficult on him, and many of us can empathize with that. Fearing that you might lose a friend, lose a loved one, because you chose to accept Islam. Mus'ab decided that the best course would be to conceal his acceptance of Islam, await a solution from Allah for his predicament. He continued to frequent the house of Al-Arqam and sit in the company of the Prophet. He felt serene in his new faith. And by keeping all indications of his acceptance of Islam away from her, he managed to stave off his mother's anger, but not for long. And many of us can, 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 can empathize with that too. Concealing your faith or trying to conceal it, trying to find the right time, the right way to tell someone you love that you're afraid they're not going to re react well respond well to your acceptance of Islam, trying to find the right time, the right way to tell them, hey, I became a Muslim. Many of us can empathize with that too, fearing what their reaction is going to be. And we love them so much, and we love our faith so much, we're torn. It's, 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 a, it's a conundrum of sorts for us. We've experienced that. We can empathize with that. It was difficult during those days to keep anything secret in Mecca. The eyes and ears of the Quraysh were on every road. Behind every footstep imprinted in the soft and burning sand was a Quraysh informer. 
Before long, Mus'ab was seen as he quietly entered the house of Al-Arqam by someone called Uthman ibn Talha. On another occasion, Uthman saw Mus'ab praying in the same manner as Muhammad prayed. The conclusion was obvious. This man became a Muslim. So he started telling everyone. He started telling everyone and ultimately the word spread and reached his mother, Mus'ab's mother. With a certain humility and calm confidence, Mus'ab acknowledged that he had become a Muslim. And no doubt he explained his reason for doing so. He then recited some verses of the Qur'an, verses which had cleansed the hearts of the believers and brought them back to the natural religion of God. Mus'ab hoped the verses would soften his mother's heart and make her at least sympathetic to Islam. But instead, as Mus'ab's mother listened to her son on whom she had lavished so much care and affection, she became increasingly incensed. She felt like silencing him with a slap, but the light which radiated from Mus'ab's serene face made her unable to bring herself to strike it. Perhaps it was her mother's love which restrained her from actually beating him, but still she felt she had, not, she had to do something to avenge the gods which her son had forsaken. So the solution in her mind was to take Mus'ab into a far corner of the home and have him firmly bound and tethered. He had become a prisoner in his own home. When house arrest did not deter Mus'ab from being a Muslim, his mother starved him. She made him go days without food. Finally, she threatened to take his life. If you don't stop being a Muslim, I'll kill you myself. I'll take your life myself. But Mus'ab would not abandon his religion even when threatened with death. So separation was inevitable. The mother couldn't bring herself to kill her son, but she threatened him hoping that she could convince him to abandon Islam. He wouldn't abandon Islam. There was no choice but for them to part ways. And when the moment came, it was sad for both mother and son, but it revealed a strong persistence in disbelief on the part of the mother and an even greater persistence in faith on the part of the son. As she threw him out of her house and cut him off from all material comforts she used to lavish on him, she said, go and attend to your affairs. I'm not prepared to be a mother to you. And some of us can empathize with this. Empathize with having to choose between a loved one and faith. Being given an ultimatum. Either be Muslim or be my son. Either be Muslim or be my brother. Either be Muslim or be my nephew. Somebody you love, somebody you care for, either be Muslim or be my friend. Some of us can empathize with that, being made to choose between Islam and your faith. So Mus'ab, when his mom gave him this ultimatum, he drew close to her and he said, Mother, I advise you sincerely. I am truly concerned for your salvation. Please testify that there's no deity worthy of worship except Allah and that Muhammad is his servant and messenger. She said, I swear by the shooting stars, I shall not enter your religion even if my opinion is ridiculed and I'm declared insane. Even if everybody becomes Muslim and I'm the only non-Muslim on earth and everybody's saying, what's wrong with you? The truth is obvious. You're crazy if you don't accept Islam. She said, even then I wouldn't accept Islam. And with that, Mus'ab was cast out. When he left his mother's home, he left all the luxury and comforts he used to enjoy. After some time passed over him, living a life of forced poverty and deprivation, Mus'ab no longer a handsome, I'm sorry, Mus'ab was no longer as handsome as he had once been. His soft pampered skin became calloused. His fine clothes became tattered rags. Instead of being a sight to behold as he had been in the past, he became difficult to look at. There were times that he would come upon gatherings of companions and they would be moved to tears by his apparent indigence. But Mus'ab was unfazed by the loss of material wealth and opulence. He was determined to focus his attention to what really matters, acquiring knowledge and serving Allah and his prophet. Now, before I mention a couple of things to close out the story, I want to say that many of us can empathize with losing everything or losing a lot when we accepted Islam. Many of us can empathize with that. And here we have Mus'ab ibn Umair 
losing everything. That his life was turned basically upside down. But he was unfazed by that. Because he was more concerned with purpose of life than quality of life. I want to fulfill my purpose. I want to please Allah. I want to follow his messenger. And I want to achieve acceptance and approval from Allah, his pardon and his paradise. That's what mattered to him. He understood that the real life is a life of the hereafter. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us in the Quran, he says, وَاصْبِرْ نَفْسَكَ مَعَ الَّذِينَ يَدْعُونَ رَبَّهُمْ بِالْغَدَاتِ وَالْعَشِي يُرِيدُونَ وَجْهَةً وَلَا تَعْدُ عَيْنَاكَ عَنْهُمْ تُرِيدُ زِينَةَ الْحَيَاةِ الدُّنْيَا وَلَا تُطِعْ مَنْ أَغْفَلْنَا قَلْبَهُ عَنْ ذِكْرِنَا وَاتَّبَعَ هَوَاهُ وَكَانَ أَمْرُهُ فُرُطًا Allah says, and patiently stick with those who call upon their Lord morning and evening seeking His pleasure. Be with the believers. And the believers in many cases, they're not the richest. They're not the most influential. They're not the most powerful. And in many cases, they are downtrodden. They are marginalized. They are oppressed. Allah says, despite all of this, they don't have much. Stick with them. And do not let your eyes look beyond them, desiring the luxuries of this worldly life. And do not obey those whose hearts we have made heedless of our remembrance, who follow only their desires, and who are in a state of total loss. Allah also tells us, brothers and sisters, وَمَا هَذِهِ الْحَيَاةُ الدُّنْيَا إِلَّا لَهُونْ وَلَعِبُ وَإِنَّ الدَّارَ الْآخِرَةَ هِيَ الْحَيَوَانِ لَوْ كَانُوا يَعْلَمُونَ The life of this world is nothing more than play and amusement, but indeed the abode of the hereafter, that is the real life, if they but knew. And our beloved Prophet ﷺ, he said, be in this world like someone who is only visiting or simply passing or simply passing through. Now, before we open the floor uh, for dialogue, for contributions, uh, for questions, I want to mention a few lessons that we can take away that are pertinent to us as converts. So the first one, brothers and sisters, is that you, as a revert, as a convert, as a person who wasn't Muslim, who became Muslim, you are not alone. You are not the first to convert to Islam and face hardship, to lose something or everything from this world as a consequence. You're not alone. You are not alone in that. And in many cases, the knowledge that you're not alone helps us stand firm upon the path. Sometimes when you feel that you're all alone, I'm the only one who's suffering like this, facing hardship like this, it makes it difficult to carry on. But when you know there are others who are carrying on and suffering like you've suffered or suffering more than you suffered, it helps you to carry on. That's why this group therapy is so important. Being together like this is so important. The second lesson, brothers and sisters, you are an excellent company. Not only are you not alone, you're an excellent company. The vast majority of the Prophet's companions were converts. And they were the very best Muslims and the best of mankind. As the Prophet said, nasi qarni. Yalunahum, yalunahum. He said, the best of mankind is my, my generation, my companions. They're the very best and they were, the vast majority of them were just like you. They were converts. They were people who worshipped idols, people who worshiped rocks and trees and became Muslim and then became the very best of mankind. People who drank wine, people who fornicated, people who were filthy and became Muslim and cleaned themselves up. And not just cleaned themselves up, but became the very best of mankind. You were an excellent company. Number three, being a convert doesn't make you less Muslim or less of a Muslim. The best Muslims of all time were converts. Abu Bakr was a convert, Omar was a convert, Uthman was a convert, Ali was a convert, and so on and so forth. The best Muslims, the best people were converts. And so therefore, no matter what people try to tell you who are not converts, who were born Muslim and have been Muslim since time immemorial, they're gonna tell you that 
you're not good enough, you're less of a Muslim, or you're less Muslim. We know that's not the case because the best Muslims of all time were converts. Abu Bakr was a convert, Umar was a convert, Uthman was a convert, Ali was a convert, and down the line, and they were the best of people. Number four, new, peculiar, to the masses doesn't equate to wrong. Just because something is new and different to the masses doesn't make it wrong. Your family and friends may not understand or agree with your choice, the choice you've made. That doesn't make it the wrong choice. And we have to understand this as the Prophet said in the Hadith, he said, Inna al-Islam abada'a gharibaan wa sayyudu gharibaan kama bada fatuba lil ghuraba. He said, indeed, Islam began as something strange and it will return strange, odd, weird, peculiar to the masses as it began. But paradise is for the strangers. It's okay to be strange. It's okay to cover your hair and your body when everybody else is naked. It's okay to be moral when everybody else is immoral. It's okay because paradise is for the moral people. Paradise is for the women who wear hijab. And remember that in the Quran, read the Quran. Allah tells us about al-akthar, the majority of people. He tells, for example, wa akthar nasi la ya'lamun, la yashkurun, yajhalun. He says most of the people don't know. Most of the people are not grateful. Most of the people are ignorant. So we don't want to be from the most. We want to be from those strangers that are going to receive paradise number five from the lessons. Being concerned, even fearful of how our family and friends will react to our con con conversion is a real and valid concern that should, should not be minimalized, demeaned or downplayed. You're going to hear people who were born Muslim. They're going to say they don't know what it's like to go against everything, everything that you've known. They don't know what that's like to go against everything and everyone that you've known. And to go from being part of a group to being alone. They don't know what that's like and they're going to say, oh, don't be afraid. Whatever happens, happens. Why? Because they're not going to stand. They're not going to they're not going to experience themselves, nor are they going to support you if it doesn't turn out the way you hope it does. So it's easy for them to minimalize it. It shouldn't be minimalized. And that's why we need the therapy. We need each other because we can understand and we're not going to minimalize. We're not going to demean. We're not going to downplay. Yeah, that's a, that, 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 that struggle is real. That fear is real. We understand that. Number six, our family, friends, co-workers, classmates, neighbors, and other associates may meet our conversion, our choice to follow Islam with hostility. But this should not deter us from following this path or lead us to compromise to appease them. Can't compromise to appease them. Can't leave Islam because it'll make them happy. You see the brother, you see Mus'ab radiallahu anhu, what his mom put him through. But he was undeterred. He was unfazed. And many of us haven't faced what he faced. We face some stuff. Not demeaning it, not negating it, not downplaying it, but we haven't, many of us, most of us have not faced what Mus'ab faced. He remained strong. So if we face less than what he faced, we can also remain, we should also remain strong. Number seven, we are required to meet the hostility of our loved ones with kindness and compassion. And despite this hostility towards Islam, we must invite them to see its beauty and embrace it as we have. This is another thing, brothers and sisters, in many cases what we do is we have relatives who are hostile towards Islam. They say things, sometimes they're passive aggressive. They say passive aggressive things. They make these little microaggressions against Islam. Or some of them are what? Actively aggressive towards us and towards Islam. And what we think the best course is, is just to what? To sit on our hands, to shut our mouth, and not to say anything about Islam, if we can avoid it. But the example of Mus'ab is teaching us that we have to call to Islam. Despite that hostility, we got to invite them. We got to meet their cruelty with kindness and we got to call them to Islam, invite them to Islam. Let them try to make them see the beauty in Islam that we see. Number eight, 
Converts may face harsh consequences and feel like they are being punished for accepting the truth and following God's path. But we have to realize, brothers and sisters, that many of the prophet's companions were persecuted, starved, threatened with death, and some were actually killed for becoming Muslims. Similarly, some of our brothers and sisters, some people we know, real talk, have been kicked out of their parents' homes, forced to live in their cars on the street, some have lost jobs, friends, and opportunities because they accepted Islam. Oftentimes, there's very little sympathy or support from the Muslim community. These people get kicked out of their homes and they go to the Muslim community, go to the mosque, can you help me, can you... And they don't get the help that they need. They don't get supported. They're told to find their own way by their newfound brothers and sisters in faith. Number nine, the story of Mus'ab helps us realize that we are likely to be tested. These tests are reality. It's likely to happen. It happened to him and they were the, it happened to them and they were the best of mankind. So who are we? And the test is part of the journey. We need to realize that it's part of the journey and it's actually an indication that we made the right decision. What does Allah say about testing in the Quran? He says, أَحَسِبَ النَّاسِ and you talk when you call amen now whom they have to do the people think they're going to be left alone saying we believe and not be tested do they think they're going to say we believe and we're not going to test them to see if they really believe we're not going to test their commitment to faith we have certainly tested those before them do you think you're special you think we're going to test them but we're not going to test you and through these tests, Allah is going to reveal those who are truthful and distinguish them from those who are lying, those who say we believe and they really mean it, and those who don't really mean it. Last but not least from the lessons is it is critical for us to remember when faced with these tests, because we're going to be tested, as Mus'ab and other persecuted believers recognize when they were tested. We need to recognize as they recognized. That this world is a means to an end. Underscore that. That's why we recited those ayat at the end and that hadith. This world is a means to an end. Not an end in of itself. We are here to fulfill the purpose of life. We're here to do God's work and God's will. And we're not here to achieve a certain quality of life. So when you're tested and the quality of life is compromised... Don't say, maybe I made the wrong decision. No, because it's not about quality of life, it's about purpose of life. Am I fulfilling my purpose? Am I doing Allah's will? Am I living the way Allah wants me to live? If I'm living the way Allah wants me to live, this is all part of the journey. This is part of the journey, this is part of me being a believer, being tested, being purified, being made better. Earning Allah's approval, His acceptance, His pardon, and His paradise. It's all part of the journey. As long as I'm living by God's will, I shouldn't be too overly concerned with quality of life. I need to make sure I'm fulfilling the purpose of life. And what's the purpose of life? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَمَا خَلَقْتُ الْجِنَّ وَالْإِنسَ إِلَّا لِعَبُدُونَ We have not created mankind and jinn kind except, except to worship their Creator, to worship Allah, to worship God. And with that, brothers and sisters, uh, I will close my mouth and offer you the opportunity uh, to comment, to ask questions, and to weigh in on what has been said or just something that's on your mind. Fatafadalu mashkura. Mashkurin. If there's anybody in the audience who would like to come up, please raise your hand and we'll bring you up on stage. Um, can anybody hear me? I do have the red bar. Yeah, we can hear you. She says, I'm there you go. Jazakallah khair, Imam Abdullah. May Allah reward your abundance. That was a very beautiful submission. Um, I would appreciate if you could maybe um, refresh us on the 10 lessons. I missed some part of it. I couldn't maybe... I was, I was trying to take notes on some of them because those, those are very insightful. So please, if you could just refresh us on the 10 lessons. Was that kind of thing? Uh, Ebshir, Ebshir. Uh, so the first lesson we, we said, I'll try to summarize them because I do realize I, I kind of expanded on them in the course of, of... Instead of just saying them in bullets, I kind of expanded and that makes it difficult to take notes. May Allah bless you for taking notes. Uh, 
So the first one is you're not alone. You're not alone. We can summarize the first lesson as you're not alone. Meaning you're not the first to convert to Islam. You're not alone. Uh, the second lesson, you are an excellent company. You're an excellent company. And we, say, we explain what that means is that the vast majority of the Prophet's companions were, were converts. The third lesson was being a convert does not make you less Muslim. Being a convert does not make you less Muslim. Uh, the fourth lesson was new or peculiar to the masses doesn't equate to wrong. Doesn't equate to wrong. The fifth lesson, being concerned or fearful of how family and friends will react is valid. Being concerned or fearful of how family and friends will react to your conversion, I mean, is valid. Number six, our conversion may be met. Uh, let me actually, let me reword that because that's a long one. Let me, let me shorten it. Let me say, Let's just say it like this. The hostility of friends and family should not deter us. Let's put it like that. The hostility of friends and family should not deter us. Uh, number seven. Meet the hostility of loved ones with kindness and dawa. Meet the hostility of loved ones with kindness and dawa. Kindness and dawah meaning what? That you call them, you invite them to Islam. Number eight is that converts may face hardship and feel that they're being punished, but they're not being punished. They may face hardship upon converting or as a direct result of converting and think that they're being punished but they're not being punished they're being tested not being punished they're being tested number nine the test is part of the journey the test is part of the journey the test is part of the journey. And number 10, the world, when you're tested, remember. When you're tested, remember. This world is a means to an end, not an end in and of itself. When you're tested, remember, this world is a means to an end, not an end in and of itself. Barakallahu feek ya sheikh Barakallahu feek ya sheikh Tayyib uh, anybody else uh, have something that they want to share they want to say Assalamu alaikum I have, I have something to say but as part of being a new convert um, and you're on this new journey you found Islam and you, of course you want to spread the word to everybody but you have, let's say, a, a, a young child that still doesn't understand the concept of Islam, even after they've been introduced. So, um, like, how do you really try to get that through that person's head to make them understand <clears throat> after you felt like you, you know, you may do a, and you really try, like, any suggestions or any comments on how you would deal with that situation? All right, this is actually something that I hope will make uh, a, a separate, uh, will dedicate one of the roundtables uh, to this topic, the topic of uh, non-Muslim children. So it's not uncommon for people to convert to Islam after they already have children, and some of those children have reached an age where they just can't be uh, made to be Muslim, or 
basically told you're Muslim. They're not little kids. They're teenagers or they're young adults. And it's a, it's, it has to be a matter of choice because they are at an age where they have to make that decision in order for it to be valid. And so we actually do want to dedicate a one session or maybe a few sessions to talking about um, how do we deal with um, the reality of having non-Muslim children after we've converted. But for, uh, but for now, what I would say is one, um, the first thing that I think a parent is going to have to do is they're going to have to really set the most excellent example. And this is really true for a parent, even if they have uh, children who've uh, grown up as Muslim or have chosen to convert along with them if they converted later in the child's life. But one of the main things that we have to do is we have to set an excellent example. We have to kind of demonstrate practically that this is the best choice. This is the best option. And I think that this is one of the first things that we need to do. It's important for children, especially uh, young adult children, to see they're going to follow what they see you do, not what they say you do. So um, typically what we as parents do is we say, do as I say, not as I do. But our young adult children, they think they, their mind is wired the opposite way. They're going to do what they see us do. They don't care about what we say. And so I think the, one of the first things we have to do is set an excellent example. We have to be the best Muslims we can be and demonstrate to them how Islam is changing our lives and changing who we are and changing how we comport ourselves, etc. Uh, the second thing is that um, we have to know how to uh, deliver the message. We have to deliver the message in a way that is likely to be um, palatable for them. I think sometimes uh, we unintentionally can be aggressive in how we present Islam. And when you're aggressive, that aggression, which is born out of passion and, and, and care and concern, we want you to be Muslim because if you die upon disbelief, you'll, you'll go to hell and we don't want that to happen to you. That's fine for that to be on the inside. But when the message comes out, we have to deliver it in a way that is compassionate, that is soft, that is gentle, that is palatable. Our beloved Prophet, he said, he said, Inna Allah rafiqun yuhibur rifq. Yu'ti ala rifqi ma la yu'ti al umfi wa ma la yu'ti bil rifqi ma la yu'ti bil umfi wa wa la ma siwahu. He said, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is gentle. And he loves gentleness. He gives through gentleness what he does not give through harshness or any other approach. So it's very important to be gentle. And it's not always easy, especially with your own kids. It's like when you're trying to teach your, 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 your child math. And if you were teaching somebody, if you were tutoring somebody else's kid and they made mistakes and they made the same mistake over and over, somehow, some way we find a way to be patient. Oh, it's going to be all right. Oh, you're going to get it. And when it's our own kid, you know, our, our tone is different. Our tolerance is less. Our tempers get flared up really quickly because why? We're so invested emotionally in these kids. And so we have to be very careful with that when we're presenting Islam to these young kids, especially young adult kids. Uh, the next thing I would say is we need to use wisdom. We have to use wisdom, which means bil aham fal aham. We have to begin with, begin with the most important things. I think another mistake that we make is we're dealing with kids that have no faith. They don't believe in God or they somewhat believe in God or they have an, a, a very uh, poor concept of God. They don't revere God. They don't respect God. They don't think they owe God anything. They don't know who God is to respect him and to revere him and to love him, and to worship him. And we start talking about hijab. You got to cover up. You know, you got to pray. You got to. We're talking about things. We're putting the cart before the horse. You can't pray to Allah and that prayer mean anything if you don't believe in Allah, if you don't love Allah, if you don't um, fear Allah, if you don't have the your heart isn't filled with the greatness of Allah. And so this is where we need to start with kids. And this is our failing. 
our kids, when you hear a child saying that, um, you know, I, I just don't feel a connection with God, then that's where I need to start. I need to start with building that connection, making you see that, look, all this didn't happen and come into place without Allah. That we live in this world because there is a creator and that creator expects something in return for all these gifts and favors. We need to, you know, ink, we need to basically uh, help the kids internalize that. And it sometimes is a process. But coming back to the main point, we need to use wisdom. Start with the most important things and work our way up. Build a foundation, a solid foundation upon which the Islam of our child can stand and stand firm. Uh, and last but not least, you kind of mentioned it in your, um, in your question. It's lots of dua. We got to pray for these kids, man. And one of the supplications that's always accepted is the dua of a parent for their child. And don't think, well, I've been praying. I've been praying. It's unchanging. The needle has not moved. We're not operating on our time. We're operating on Allah's time. Keep knocking on the door. Keep knocking on the door and praying and praying and praying and Allah is going to open the door. Allah is going to answer. He always answers. He promised in the Quran to answer and he never breaks his promise. And your Lord says, call upon me, I will answer your prayer. And he says in the Quran, he says, He says, he says and if they ask you about me, I am near to them. I answer the prayer of the one who calls upon me when he prays. Allah is going to answer, but sometimes he delays the answer, not because he's stingy, not because he gets some type of sick pleasure out of making us wait, but he delays the answer because he loves to hear us pray. He loves to reward us for prayer. And Ibn Kathiri mentioned in Tafsir, he said that there was, a, there was a servant, a pious servant from Bani Israel, who Allah loved. And he tested him, he tried him, he put him to trial. And the angels who were in the presence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, they asked, they said, oh Allah, why are you trying him like this when we know you love him? And Allah answered the angels and he said, لِأَنِّي أُحِبُّ أَنْ أَسْمَعَ sota. He said, because I love to hear his voice calling upon me, calling out to me, praying to me for his needs. And so, my last uh, encouragement for the sister and all the brothers and sisters who are dealing with this is to be constant in prayer. Be constant in prayer and asking Allah for the guidance of your child, knowing that he's going to answer. Because one of the supplications which is always answered is the prayer of a parent for their child. And how many times? Because you hear people complain all the time. My child is a Muslim. My, 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 my son doesn't want to pray. My, my, my daughter doesn't want to go to the masjid. My daughters want to cover. You hear people saying this, but how, how many of those people get up in the middle of the night and beg Allah to guide their child? How many of them are doing that? Not knocking on the door, but expecting it to open. So this is a key thing. We got to pray. Anything we want from Allah, especially the guidance of our kids, we got to pray. Any other... Uh... Yeah, um, this is like a lot of confidence, brother. Sorry. Um... I know, and I do want to keep it reminded because we're coming up on the um, on the hour. Right, um, right, right, right. And um, <laughs> um, brother Salim, um, if you could unmute your mic. Okay, mashallah. There you go. Okay, Bismillah. Alhamdulillah. Wa salatu wa salamu ala Rasulullah. Yeah, just basically just going um, back, you know, to the core, you know, of the discussion. You know, I, um, you know, reflected upon, you know, the entering into this dean and, you know, the many different things that occurred and, you know, have occurred. And the thing is, as Allah says, You know, this knowledge, you know, with certainty that there is none worthy of worship but Allah and really getting to know Allah not just theoretically, you know, in terms of his name qualities and attributes, but to actualize this in the way that you treat Allah, in the way you treat his creation, all of his creation is imperative. And then also getting to know the chosen Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in terms of a behavior modification, you know, using 
you know, Islam as a means of purification of the soul and of the self and to remove those things that uh, are very difficult, you know, in terms of the habits that are not good or pleasing to Allah and ask for his help and his forgiveness. And then to know that, you know, knowledge, knowledge is first, you know, you have to know. And then the, the fact of after the knowledge is to act. And, uh, you know, as mentioned, Abdullah, you mentioned about hikmah, you know, having wisdom, you know, putting the right thing in the right place at the right time. But one has to, first of all, inoculate themselves. They have to be inoculated with iman, each and every one of us. And the many problems we had in terms of self-actualization, inferiority complexes and the like, in terms of emulate others and, and so really not... I'm sorry, can we narrow it down just a little bit more? We're on a two-limit okay. limit. Yeah. Okay. Will do, but I'm just saying we, we have to, you know, just get back to that foundation and the purification of ourselves and then to that dawah to, you know, others, you know, may develop, you know, some fruit by following that modality. But it's, it's a long story, so I'm going to stop here, but, you know, barakallah fi. Wafikum barakallah salim jazakallah khairan for that uh, that comment jazakallah khairan Anybody else want to have something to say or uh, make a comment or ask a question? Um, I want to remind you that uh, we'll be back uh, next month. We'll send out the date uh, here in a couple days so that you can plan accordingly and Remember we're looking for topics. We're looking for topic suggestions. We gave at the top of the class We gave some email addresses that you can email us your topics Email us at all of those so that if one ends up not getting to us the other will get to us and just let us know um, What you're thinking as far as what you like to hear in the coming in the coming sessions inshallah ta'ala also let us know what you think about frequency if you want to make it weekly We can do that you want to make it bi-monthly every other week. We can do that it's up to you as the audience. Again, our main goal, uh, overarching goal, is for this to be group therapy, man. For us to talk about the issues that are pertinent to us as individual converts and as a collective um, tribe of people who are living with an experience um, that is that, that very few people can really empathize with. Uh, go ahead if anybody has any questions or comments. Wa alaikum salam. I am the only Muslim per Muslim Muslim in my family. It's been really hard because I've gotten all kind of abuse, and I've talked to an Emma who he told me that Allah doesn't do with oppression, and I've lost some friendships along the way. But I also noticed that some of the Muslim men are kind of strange. They ask you for support to get businesses and things situated and i said you know that is so strange outside of the abuse that i go to from non-believers and all i ask them is you know what just respect my belief in islam i don't ask them anything that is un they're unable to do but is that normal when you're a new um Revert is that you come against all kinds of hostility like every day is something constantly that it kind of starts to test your sanity and you have to go back to Allah and just pray and ask him, you know, what am I learning in this test? Um, can I say that it's, it's normal? Um, I don't know if normal would be the word I would use. I would just say that it could happen. We can be tested. And Allah knows best who to test and how to test them. Uh, one thing that we need to bear in mind is la yukallifullahu nafsan illa illa wusaha. That Allah does not place a burden on a soul greater than it can bear. And so Allah knows what we can bear, what we can tolerate. And sometimes to us, the test appears unbearable. But in reality, we have underestimated ourselves. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala... He wouldn't test us with a test which was beyond our capacity. So if he's testing us with it, we can bear it. But in addition to that, I want to say that if you're being tested and you are able to change your environment, change your surroundings, change um, your circle, and that 
changing of the environment, the circle, the circumstances will relieve some or all of those tests, you are supposed to do that. And sometimes we tend to associate with toxic people and we become victims of their toxicity. And so if you have toxic people in your circle, you love them, they're your friends or your family, but they're hurting you and having them in your circle and in your, in your space is causing you pain, causing you to be tested, then yeah, you should step away from those people and minimize the tests that you face as a consequence. So I hope that it helps just as a short answer, but um, um, I hope that helps uh, as a short answer, but this topic that you're mentioning is something that we should deal with in a session or two or three because a lot of us are facing this, where we become Muslim and family comes at us, friends come at us, we lose things. And even sometimes we're duped and taken advantage of by the Muslim communities, the immigrant Muslim communities. And so these are issues that we need to confront and I hope that you guys will write to us and tell us, hey, can we talk about this? Because we may forget. And we need to have the topics in black and white so we can go ahead and organize them and begin to uh, address them uh, one session at a time. Uh, any other questions or comments? Jazakallah Brother Abu Farid. And then Sister Jackie, if you have something, then you can go after Abu Farid, inshallah. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Sheikh Abdullah. Alhamdulillah, Sheikh Barak. Sheikh, how you doing, Akhi? Alhamdulillah, Alhamdulillah. I want to thank you for, you know, uh, putting this forward to Revert Reflections. You know that I, I, I love uh, putting you forward to the people because uh, your, your, your method of da'wah, I think, uh, is really beneficial for the people. Exactly. Uh, and, and listening to your opening um, and, and your Revert Reflections that you do on Instagram, I, I listen to every, every one of them every morning. Uh, I can't help but to think about... Um, this uh, minority group of Muslims that's unique uh, in the history of Muslims um, that exists uh, in the West. And that is a, a group that I'm a part of, and I think many people in this room may be also a part of. Uh, and that group is this underrepresented group of Muslims who were born to parents, raised, you know, Muslim born and raised Muslim, but not in a Muslim world, but born in the West to Muslim parents. And they grew up in the West uh, in a society where Islam is not practiced, Islam is shunned, um, and many of their, their relatives are also non-Muslim. And that poses a very unique situation for those children, because even though they grew up Muslim, they're not growing up Muslim in the Muslim world, and their parents, many of them, their understanding, their aqidah, their practice, their, their, their adherence to the sunnah was, uh, you know, it was at an a, a infant-style uh, stage. You know, like my parents came from the Nation of Islam. Mm -hmm. you know, their aqidah was totally, you know, jacked up. Um, and so, you know, if you don't have it, it's almost impossible for you to give it. So mm -hmm. many of these children, they grew up in households where... You know they're Muslim, but they don't really understand Islam. And you know there there are children that go to you know experience so much trauma, mental health issues, and everything just because of the the other children, especially if they're minorities. If you're you know if you're you know African American, uh, Indo Pak, Arab, you grow you know you you grow up in a, uh, in a you go to a school where you know you might be a minority just because of your skin tone. But then also those people that you would have some type of closeness to, they they uh you know you don't even have that closeness with them because uh, you're you're Muslim and they're Christian or there's something else. So I I will hope that at one point, inshallah, I want to uh, close up that um, we have a, a similar type of group in therapy for this mis underrepresented group of Muslims that you know I I tend to be a part of and. You know, we, we have some similarities with reverts, but not the same. Jazakallah khairan. Wallahi, uh, very good uh, comment, very good contribution to the discussion. 
I just want to say to kind of piggyback off of that as it relates to the revert community and definitely not stepping over what you said or um, or demeaning its importance. It is a very significant um, contribution mentioned, something that we definitely need to to talk about because it's a reality. But one of the things that the two groups do have in common that you kind of shared is having a, a poor understanding of Islam. Those of us who converted, we're, we're, we're coming into Islam as infants. We're coming into Islam as babies. And like babies, we need to be spoon-fed Islam at the, in, at the quantity and with the, um, the consistency that suits our age and our development spiritually. And I think some of us, we come into Islam and we start eating metaphorically, figuratively speaking, steak. And we're not even, we're at the breast milk stage. Or we're at the, you know, you know that, uh, the baby food, you know, what is it, <laughs> crushed peas or whatever, we're at that stage. But we start getting ahead of ourselves. And as a consequence, the foundation is very, very weak. The roots that are supposed to support the tree of the man are not firmly established in the heart. And as a consequence, when the strong winds of fitna, the strong winds of trials and tests, the strong winds of doubt and misconceptions blow, our tree gets uprooted. The tree of faith gets uprooted and we go astray. And this is the time and the opportunity for us, brothers and sisters, to really learn the deen and to build ourselves from the bottom up. Some of us have gotten ahead of ourselves. We've been Muslim for a while and we're doing things and saying things and participating in things that are totally un-Islamic and we don't even realize it. And I hear people, I, I, I talk to people and they'll say things that are idolatrous. They do things like participating, you know, just what just passed, Halloween. And what's coming now is the season of hanging wreaths, for example. What's the history of wreaths? What, what, what is that about? Do we know? Do we know that it has some, it's associated with paganism? And after paganism was associated with Christianity and the meanings that the pagans and the Christians assigned to it and how that's not something that a Muslim should associate themselves with? Do we really understand that? Do we understand why we shouldn't do these things? And, and so... What uh, Abu Farid mentioned is pertinent to not just the, the, the group that he mentioned, but to us reverts as well, that many of us have to humble ourselves and have to make a concerted effort to really learn the deen and build ourselves from the ground up. And this is our opportunity here with the round table. And I have a few other programs. Again, I don't want to shop my wares here. But, you know, I have the platform, we have the Facebook page, we have the Instagram page, and every day on Instagram in the mornings, we do something called Revert Reflections. A short reminder where we're trying to do just this. Build the convert Muslims, the revert Muslims from the ground up. The basics. Spoon feeding us so we can grow up to be strong, functioning Muslims, the Muslims that the Prophet said, he said, He said, the strong Muslim is more beloved and superior in the sight of Allah than the weak Muslim, although in both of them there is good. We want to be that strong believer. And so we need to build ourselves up properly. And this is our opportunity to do this through these, uh, through the round table and as well through these revert reflections that we're doing daily on Instagram. So if you're not following us on Instagram, please do, a Asafi. And follow us on Facebook. Um, please do that because why? This is, this is one of our focuses and our main goals is to build the Muslims at large and build the Muslims particularly who are reverts build them from the ground up, teach them the basics, help them to have a firm, clear, correct understanding of their Islam so they can practice it correctly. Uh, any other questions or comments or, or, uh, or contributions? Um, yes, just the Kalu, inshallah, you can take them out. Zai, did you say my name? 
Yes, it's the Kahlua. I'm going to be back okay. and take the mic. Like, the the Zach and they don't sound like this. Just, I heard Sister Blue. I was like, who's Sister Blue? <laughs> 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 oh, my gosh. Wa alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Wa alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa for such a wonderful, wonderful session, subhanAllah. Um, it was just beautiful. It was such a good reminder, subhanAllah, especially when we were talking about the element of test. Such a beautiful reminder. I just wanted to, A, just to thank you for giving us of your time and for sharing this uh, wonderful session with us. But in addition to ask uh, a question around, um, uh, selfishly, uh, I, I asked this, about... Um, I'm not sure how to phrase it, so I'll just kind of uh, stream of conscious this one. It, essentially, how we could have like um, uh, cross learning, essentially, between uh, converts or reverts. I'm not sure the the term reverts is what's being used here. Um, so reverts uh, with quote unquote born Muslims, especially thinking about um, what Brother um, Abu Farid mentioned, and then thinking about this type of almost identity. Uh, crisis that kind of exists within some of the the Muslim youth of today, in and combining that with this almost uh, um, uh, strange uh, uh, intersection of faith and culture, and how at times it can be like oil and water, and how reverts could essentially help Muslims that are uh, born into the faith or generational Muslims actually start to kind of lean even more into that Islamic cultural identity. Um, and learning to be resilient under that umbrella, um, just based off of the, the nature of their stories um, as well. Um, I find that oftentimes on stages um, that are generational Muslims, there's a lot of culture that supersedes just basic Islamic knowledge, um, as well as uh, a strong Islamic a Muslim identity. And I would love to see how we could do like a collaboration in, in a, essentially where born Muslims are able to kind of learn some of that Izzah that they might have forgotten from revered Muslims as well. MashaAllah, MashaAllah, MashaAllah. Wallahi, a very good uh, contribution, a very good suggestion for a future, um, uh, a future discussion, I guess. Um, what I would say is that everything is possible. Everything is possible and everything is on the table, especially everything that's going to help us be better help us be more confident, help us be more comfortable in our own skin, uh, help us um, connect with each other and be um, supports for each other. Even if we're not in the same physical brick and mortar community, um, we're open to all of that. And um, I would appreciate it, uh, Sister Khulud, if you could um, kind of summarize that and send it uh, in an email. Uh, so that we can figure out how we can do that. How can we t make something like that happen? Because it's a very good suggestion. But I will say too is that um, there's no question that born Muslims can benefit a great deal from reverts or converts. And both, to be honest with you, it's semantics. I mean, both words uh, work. Uh, both, both terms work. So they can learn a lot from us. There's no question about that. But I think one of the ways that we can really help them is by first helping ourselves. We really, really have to ground ourselves in our knowledge and our faith. And this is one of the reasons why we're trying to do what we're doing now and doing here uh, with these uh, conversations is we need to kind of, before we can go and help others, we kind of need to help ourselves and we need to get ourselves uh, together. But I do think that what you said is something that we should try to do because at the end of the day, they are our brothers and sisters. And we sometimes you have to get with people who share your experience. You need to do that. But what we want to avoid doing is being exclusive and starting to divide and separate ourselves and not consider ourselves a part of the greater community. So I think what you're suggesting will also help us avoid uh, doing that. What would that look like? How is that going to play out? It's something that kind of have to, you know, um, have to think about it. But I think it's a very good suggestion and I would appreciate it if you would send us an email so that we can um, really, really have it in black and white and think about how to pull that off and when would be the, would be the best time to pull it off. 
just like look at chef i sent you a back channel for the email address i don't have it so if you can send it to me i will uh, put this into an email instead Okay, all right, perfect. Um, let me, uh, I, I need to send that to Zahida so she can put that up. So let me. Um, Abdullah, Efron, can you put your email address in your bio? Like the, all your email addresses? Yeah, okay, I appreciate that. Very good suggestion. Very good suggestion, and we'll get on it. We will get on it, inshallah, we will get on it. Any other, I'm going to type up these and send them to uh, Sister Zahida, and she'll put it in the back channel. Uh, anybody else have any other questions, comments, or complaints before we close out? I think we're good, brother. Sorry, inshallah. All right. Well, um, let me close out by saying uh, again, uh, repeating or reiterating, as I said at the outset, thank you guys for coming. Uh, really good attendance today. Um, I, th I think we had a good session. Uh, it was good to see all of you here. I hope that we'll see you uh, the next time we get together and see more uh, people as well. I hope you'll spread the word and encourage others to attend. I also hope that I'll see you guys uh, subscribing to our YouTube uh, channel, subscribing to uh, or following us on Instagram and Facebook. Join us. We're trying to do this work. Um, we're trying to help people in our uh, situation and build us all from the ground up. Uh, and we need your support to do that. We need your support to make it happen. Uh, and so I look forward to seeing more of you uh, following some of those, some of that programming and following us on some of those platforms. And uh, with that, inshallah, we'll bring it to a close. I'm going to send these email addresses to Sister Zahida uh, so she can put them up where people can access them. I will also take uh, Abu Farid's advice and add uh, the email addresses to my bio. So you'll have those. That's, you'll see that as well. And again, thank you all. Thank you all. May Allah bless you. Bless the rest of your evening. Bless your houses. Bless your spouses. Bless your children. Bless your income. Bless you and make you bless wherever you you may be. Hada wa sallallahu wa sallam wa baraka wa Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi jamiin. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.